Good morning. Good morning. This is certainly a great morning to have so many of you come for the, our interactive Sojourner Truth Legacy Project Forum entitled Black Women on Politics, Claiming Our Collective Voice. All of our brothers and sisters and dynamic people from the Congressional Black Caucus, it's a pleasure to have you. There's only one person, one person in the world, in Washington, from Florida, anywhere, that could guide us through this dynamic discussion. And you see her almost daily on MSNBC. Joy Ann Reed. <laughs> I am so proud of her, and I have watched her grow and develop through this whole process of politics, radio, television. She is just wonderful. She had a radio show in Miami, and it received rave reviews. No one could wait to get up in the morning to tune in and call in on the station to hear Joy's perspective on today's politics. And since that time, she's even bigger. So in Miami, we all say Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach, all over Florida. We call her our hometown heroine who has moved up through the ranks and brought so much pride in our little girls who we see every day, and to all of the black women who watch television, she is the star. She's a columnist for the Miami Herald. She is the, um, she, her columns have appeared on Salon, The Griot, Common Dreams. In fact, she's the managing editor of The Griot, and I'm sure all of you are uh, familiar with that. And in Miami and in South Florida, we have a newspaper in Broward County called the South Florida Sun Sentinel. She's in there all the time giving her views and she always takes a view that is positive for African American people. She shows the world what we could be and should be. She breaks it down and shows how we must live. And she writes also so frequently for the South Florida Times and the Miami Times, which are two black weeklies. Without further ado, let me introduce to you my homegirl, my friend, oh, my heroine, Joy Ann Reed. <laughs> well, thank you very much and good morning. Everybody's so polite. In Miami, they're like, good morning, real loud. Um, well, I want to say that I am here in response um, to a call from my congresswoman. Now, technically, technically, I don't live in Congresswoman Frederica Wilson's district. I live in New York now. And even when I lived in Florida, technically, <laughs> I didn't live in, in the congresswoman's district. But when people who know me hear me say my congresswoman, they know that I am talking about uh, Frederica Wilson because she has been so supportive of me when I was just thinking about doing this. Um, she's always been so encouraging, and she's just such a dear person. So um, I have to acknowledge and ask you to acknowledge my congresswoman, Frederica S. Wilson. And she's fabulous, too. And I want to thank um, uh, the, the CBC Foundation uh, for inviting me here today. Um, I, I just cannot tell you how, what an honor it is um, to be asked to moderate uh, this. And this is really extraordinary. This is an intergenerational gathering of women um, who are committed to empower themselves. Uh, and these are really important areas that impact our lives, whether it's economics, education, health, politics, or criminal justice. Uh, and of course, this year, as we know, we face one of the most pivotal and important elections in our lifetimes. Hello. Uh, and we do know that no matter who wins, hello, come on, church. <laughs> we know that African-American women are going to have to get into the habit of advocating for themselves. We have to, that's on us to advocate for the things that are important to us. And that is what the Sojourner Truth Legacy, Pro, uh, Legacy Project Forum is all about. Um, it's about understanding together where we are as a people and working shoulder to shoulder to close the gap between where we are today and where we need to be. Um, to fully leverage our power and claim our collective voice. So no matter how things seem at times 
for African American women who historically and today carry more than our fair share of the responsibility in addressing the needs of our community, and we all know that that is the case. This morning, we remember women like Shirley Chisholm, right? Guyanese American, like myself, so I love that. Um, Barbara Jordan, Coretta Scott King, uh, Dorothy Height, and so many others for whom, in the words of Langston Hughes, life ain't been no crystal staircase. So in the spirit of many of the trailblazers on whose shoulders we now stand, our forum this morning is truly about making real the theme black women on politics claiming our collective voice. And nothing helps us to remember our journey toward freedom as we claim our collective voice like the Negro National Anthem, which we're gonna have led this morning by actress and singer, Ms. Mary Milben. Now, Ms. Milben has been a featured soloist for the White House, for the Kennedy Center, and on stages around the globe. Uh, she is a Helen Hayes Award nominee, a former White House intern, and a White House presidential appointee. So please join me in acknowledging uh, Ms. Mary Milben. Good morning, ladies. There's nothing like being in a room with a lot of women. So I want to just quickly say thank you to Dr. Scott and to uh, Dr. Skinner for the opportunity to be here to lead you in singing, Lift Every Voice. Very quickly to get your blood flowing because we're only doing one stanza, so you gotta make a count in the one stanza this morning. Turn to someone next to you, say good morning, glad to see you, get your blood flowing a little bit and, and join me in singing, Lift Every Voice and sing. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. You can all sing on Broadway. <laughs> wonderful. Have a wonderful morning, ladies. And I forgot to mention that she's beautiful. I love the the dress as well. All right, uh, now uh, I'm gonna introduce the Litany of Truth, which is gonna be presented by Congresswoman Carolyn Cheeks Kilpatrick. Um, while we are women of different faith traditions, it has been our faith that has sustained us through the many challenges um, that we face as women. And as the Sojourner Truth Legacy Project has been intergenerational from the start, we're very pleased now to be led in our litany of truth by our intergenerational team, which will include Congresswoman Cheeks Kilpatrick, as well as Ms. Kenya Handy. For 14 years, from 1997 to 2011, Congresswoman Kilpatrick, who is from Michigan's 13th Congressional District, which includes Detroit, good morning, <laughs> and she is the former chair of the Sojourner Legacy Project. Ms. Handy serves as legislative assistant to Congresswoman Yvette Clark of Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn in the house, what? And she's been a member of the planning team for the Sojourner Truth Legacy Project from its inception. So now uh, Congresswoman Carolyn Cheeks Kilpatrick and Kenya Handy will lead us in our litany of truth if they could please come to the stage. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As she hands out copies, please give her some help. Uh, we'd like you to see, this is powerful. Sojourner Truth said, ain't I a woman? Ain't we a woman? Powerful women. The hand that rocks the cradle certainly controls the world, and that is women. God created women and with certain inalienable characteristics. So as we 
go about our daily lives jockeying and keeping the balls in the air, just remember Sojourner, remember Harriet, remember Rosa Parks, remember all our recent people that we've lost over the years. We are women, and it's, it is through us that nations are born and families are raised. So we in the Congressional Black Caucus, um, maybe three or four years ago now, felt we need to have a movement of women and girls, intergenerational, which is why Kenya and I are standing here today. And we generally start out with a, some sort of litany. In 2009, Bishop Vasti McKenzie of the AME Church opened our first sessions, and she wrote a powerful litany, some of which is that you're going to discuss with us today or hear from us as we see it. Does everybody have a copy yet? Yeah. Okay, pretty much. So as we go through this, we'd like you to join us. And where they say people, that's where you come in. That's the refrain. And when you leave this conference and in your everyday life, take it home with you. Teach it to your children, to your girls. Because we, what we hope will happen is women of the CBC will be moving across the country, starting and working with Sojourner Truth groups in your own home state. And I see some of my colleagues here from Odyssey, and we come from all over the country and around the world that we share as women. We love our men. Can't do anything without us. But if African Americans and if our country and if the world is going to achieve, it's about women. So follow us, please. Yes, and it's OK. We dedicate this to the women of the world, to all of you, to our young girls, and to a mighty Howard power that we serve. So here we go. Uh, we also ask that you just hold the hand next to you. Yes, as we are holding ours here. Yes. Black women on politics claiming our collective voice. Oh God, creator of heaven and earth, our help in ages past, because you are sovereign over nation and rulers, our hope is in you alone and in your power to help us claim our collective voice. We cherish this time to remember the long and challenging journey of our mothers and our grandmothers and the many Sojourner Truths in our lives, whose faith in the God of the weary years and silent tears have brought us this far along the way. We treasure this opportunity to consider the power of women of different generations and the girls we impact join together in a powerful movement of sisters loving, teaching, encouraging, supporting, aiding, mentoring, and nurturing one another. Today we claim our collective voice. Shower us with redeeming love, unconditional acceptance, and never-ending forgiveness that we will share more powerfully than ever one sister to another, older and younger, from diverse backgrounds, experiences, and circumstances. Help us to fix our minds and hearts on your truth, that every sister is your prized creation. Is your prized creation. That's all right. We are all right. A bearer of dignity and dignity. Your workmanship created by you for good works, and therefore worthy of our support and love. It was only by your power, your compassion, and your might that your servant Sojourner Truth was raised from the pit of degradation to the pinnacle of influence to proclaim on behalf of all women for all times and generations the critical question, ain't I a woman? May we honor her life and legacy by claiming our collective voice, raising them higher than ever, obstacles, every obstacle we, we face. face. Whether in the voting booth, the employment booth, or any other circumstance we face, until justice rolls down like a river and righteousness like ever flowing streams. We pause to remember how enslavement did not hold back our intellect, how the practices of inhumane and unjust laws could not capture her indomitable spirit and how exclusionary taxes could not contain her desire to serve a higher power. 
We pause to remember her powerful words, eloquent speeches, and her bold stands for women's rights, voting rights, freedom, and the right to full participation, partnership at every level of American enterprise. Thank you for this moment that reminds us that we can claim our collective voice and speak truth to power, remembering that truth will prevail against the vilest lies, the truth that is liberating for the speaker and the hearer, the truth that comes continues to forward march harmonizing the discord of injustice. Today we claim our collective voice. Help us to remember Sojourner Truth. May her legacy energize and stir up the multitude of gifts you have given us so that our daughters, daughters, and their daughters after them will be brave and bold, articulators of truth, closing the gap between policy and praxis for all time. Together, today our collective voice rings out in perfect harmony a voice of love over hate, justice over injustice, compassion over mean spirit, and a voice of right over might. We commit to never be silent, and the voice of every sister from every circumstance is heard in the halls of decision making and the pinnacles of power. God bless you. I think that last part is, is, part is very important that we commit to never be silent until the voice of every sister from every circumstance is heard in the halls of decision making and the pinnacles of power. That's, that's actually a powerful message. And we do have uh, and want to acknowledge that we have our elected representatives here. And really, that's what we've charged them to do. But we can't just count on them to do it alone. Um, right? We have to all commit, as we just said, to do that together as well. So I want to thank uh, Congresswoman Carolyn Cheeks Kilpatrick and Kenya Handy for that. Uh, at this point in our program, I would like to introduce um, the chair of the Sojourner Truth Legacy Project, and it is a distinct pleasure to do so. Congresswoman Yvette Clark um, will present our statement of occasion that's going to put into some perspective the vision and goals of this morning's forum. Now, as I mentioned briefly before, Congresswoman Clark is a Brooklyn native. Very proud of that, uh, having been born in that wonderful borough myself. Um, native, her native roots are firmly planted in her Jamaican heritage. She's a product of New York City Public Schools and received a scholarship to Oberlin College. And she was a, re a pre recipient of the prestigious APA Sloan Fellowship in Public Policy and Policy Analysis. She's committed to continuing the district's legacy of excellence as set forth by the late and honorable Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman and Caribbean-American elected to Congress. She serves on the Homeland Security Committee and the Small Business Committee. She's secretary of the Congressional Black Caucus, senior whip for the Democratic Caucus, and a member of the board of directors of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. She also, of course, chairs the Sojourner Truth Legacy Project. So please give a warm round of applause, if you would, to Representative Congresswoman Yvette Clark. I'd like to uh, thank Ms. Reed. I, I feel like I ought to be calling her Sister Reed. We kind of bore some church up in here this morning uh, for serving as our moderator for the dynamic intergenerational forum this morning. A pleasant good morning to everyone. It's certainly my honor and my privilege uh, to uh, receive the baton that was given to me by the Honorable Carolyn Cheeks Kilpatrick and work with my colleagues, my sisters, on Capitol Hill to help us to gain our collective voice. You make us proud every day, Ms. Reed as you speak truth to power in your hard-hitting analysis of the political landscape through various social media on behalf of the underserved people and communities across this nation. Can we give Ms. Reed another round of applause? So greetings to all of my beloved and dear sisters. And on behalf of the women, members of the Congressional Black Caucus, let me say how wonderful it is for us to gather for yet another Sojourner Truth Legacy Project Forum during the 42nd Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Annual Legislative Conference. 
Our occasion for coming together this morning is simple. Too many decisions have been made about us without us. May I say this one more time? Too many decisions have been made, are being made without us. And it's all about us. That ends right here, right now. Without our voice, without our vote, without our say about our health needs, about the training and retraining we need for today's jobs, as more and more jobs are being shipped overseas, about the quality of education our children need so they are competitive in the global marketplace, about the small businesses we need to establish and support to strengthen our communities economically, about protecting the vote for which women like Fannie Lou Hamer and others gave their very lives, and about making the criminal justice system more fair for African American women and other people of color. Without our voice, even the gains we have made in education, civil rights, voting rights, and so many other areas will simply slip away as if they never happened. So we meet today to say unequivocally, not on our watch. We will become observers to our own, will we become observers to our own demise, not on our watch. We have all the ingredients we need this morning to reclaim, reclaim our voice. As the schedule indicates, we will embrace a loving sisterhood. Ms. Sabrina Fulton, the mother of Trayvon Martin, who will be joining us shortly, who was viciously, Trayvon Martin, who was viciously attacked and murdered just for work, walking while black in an area where his father lived. We also have assembled here some of the most informed thought leaders and experience in the five key areas most impacting African American women who will share the state of black women in areas of economics, education, healthcare, politics, and criminal justice. We are blessed to have as well several CBC women members who will share as they come in and out during votes some specific actions we can take to achieve the empowerment for African American women. You've already met this, one, this morning the distinguished lady from Miami, Florida, uh, Congresswoman Frederica Wilson. I'd like to also acknowledge that here with us is the distinguished lady from uh, Cleveland, Ohio, the Honorable Congresswoman Marsha Fudge. Some say she may be the next chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. That's what some say. That's what, that's what some say. Some specific actions we can take to achieve the empowerment for African American women will be discussed this morning. And most of all, to reclaim our voice, we have you. We have each and every one of you, our sisters from across the nation, to lend our voices through the question and answer period and the, the nation to lend our voices, oh, excuse me, and closing small group dialogue on actions we will take when we return to our communities. I look forward to being a part of a robust dialogue on how we reclaim our collective voices. You see, without you, we don't get the amplification and the elevation that we need. As you see in the back of the room, there are 14 women of the Congressional Black Caucus. That is out of 535 members of Congress. We represent not only the women of the districts that we represent individually, but across this nation in districts that aren't represented by Congressional Black Caucus members. We are the voice of the voiceless. So buckle in, get your thinking caps on, because we intend to leave here today motivated, empowered, focused, and ready. Our girls depend on us. 
our senior women depend on us. Our communities depend on us. And we know that we are more than capable of rising to the occasion. God bless you all. And I would be remiss if uh, before I left this stage, I didn't just ask my own mama to stand up so that she could be recognized. The Honorable Dr. Una Clark. Is she in the room? Oh, she's not here yet. Well, when she gets here, we'll let her know. Yeah, we're going to get mom's acknowledgement in. So you guys watch the door when you see mom come in. We got we to gotta acknowledge mom. Well, thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman Clark. And I just want to let everyone know that, you know, when we send members to Congress, we, we send them there to do something very important, and that is to, to vote, right, to get to represent us. So there are going to be votes that are gonna be taking place. So I just want you guys to bear with us, bear with us because we are gonna have members who will be flowing in and out as they go to, to cast those very important votes for their constituents. So I'm gonna quickly um, bring up two of our members so that we can uh, avail ourselves of their wisdom before they do have to go to the Hill. And I'm gonna start with Congresswoman Marcia Fudge and I'll tell you a few things about her. I just had the opportunity to meet her um, before and chat with her just a little bit. And um, she's a committed public servant who brings a hardworking, problem-solving spirit to Congress, uh, especially the task of creating jobs, because that is job one. Uh, it's the most important thing. Attacking predatory lending, which we know impacts our community so much, and improving health care, small business, and education. And these characteristics were honored while she served as Warrensville Heights' first African-American female mayor. Okay, we can, we can acknowledge that. And as the city's top executive, uh, Representative Fudge led Warrensville Heights in building 200 new homes, shoring up a sagging retail base. And uh, this quote from the Honorable Louis Stokes, who represented the 11th district until his retirement, I think says it all. And he said, Congresswoman Fudge uh, continues to build upon a legacy uh, of uh, a reputation among her colleagues of being a hard worker and a knowledgeable legislator with leadership qualities. She serves on the Agriculture Committee, the Education and Workforce Committee, and she's a past national president of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Let's bring up, oh, there's a few Deltas in the house. Let's, uh, <laughs> there's a few AKAs in the house too, so we're not gonna start nothing. There's a few of, every, we, we got everybody here. Let's bring up Congresswoman Marsha Fudge. And you have a grand thing. See this red folder? <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It is really a pleasure to be here. I want to especially thank Dr. Skinner, certainly my dear friend, uh, Representative Clark. That is why this Sojourner Truth uh, con continues. Is, is Yvette took, a, took on the responsibility, and I thank you for that. Um, I want to thank all of the members of the CBC, especially the women of the CBC, uh, Frederica Wilson and, and all the others that you will see this morning. Uh, I'm just going to be very brief, and I had some prepared remarks, but I'm not really going to give them. I just want to say a few things. Um, we know that throughout the course of history, African American women have and will continue to play a major role in this country's political system. All of us stand on the shoulders. Now, Joy Reid talked about that, but there are some people sometimes we don't give credit to, and that's like the mother of the church, your grandmother. Uh, the, the block watch person, you know, Aunt Sally and Aunt Susie, who never even realizing what they were doing were teaching us the responsibilities we need to take on as black women. So I want to say thank you to all of them because I had a whole lot of them. Some of them weren't even my real aunts, but I always called them Aunt Sally or Aunt Susie <laughs> because that's how we were raised. In 2008, everyone knows that we were proud to elect our first African-American president, Mr. Barack Obama. But what you might not know is that during that cycle, black women had the highest voter turnout rate of any group of people. 68.8%, higher than any other group of people. Which just goes to show that we have the power and we need to use it. We have already been at the political table, and we will continue to be. But there are three things that I want you to do when you leave here. One is, we have to support one another. Y'all yeah, looking at me, I, I could say some real things <laughs> about how we treat one another as black women. We need to start to lift each other up and not find a way to tear each other down. Yeah. 
in my own district, the people that we worry about the most trying to challenge us or put us down, they black women. So I'm gonna leave that alone before I say, before I say something I shouldn't say. Uh, number two, we need to vote like our lives depend on it. Not just us vote, but get, I mean, we are the leaders of our families. I don't care what nobody said. We are the leaders of our families. We need to get all of our people out to vote. And third, we need to reach back. We have to find a, a way to bring young women into this system. Uh, Yvette told you we only are 14 members. We make up about 3% of the entire House of Representatives. Now, I'm not encouraging you to try to come and run against one of us. Go run against somebody else. Because <laughs> that's what y'all going to do, try to figure out when it's time to check on one of us. Don't come. Don't come. <laughs> But we are today witnessing an all-out assault on voting rights. They are doing everything they can to confuse us, to make voting more difficult. Understand this, you know something is important when people try to take it from you. And they are trying to take our vote away from us. Let us not have to fight this battle 30 years or 40 years from now. We fought it 40 years ago. We're fighting it now. Don't let our children and our grandchildren have to fight it 40 years from now. So no matter what it is, let's stop complaining about it. Go out and find out what you need to do to vote. Get whatever it is you need to vote and go vote. Because if we don't vote this time, the future of our country is at stake. Don't let people tell you anything bad about what's going on in Washington. Everybody, I disagree with my own family. So I'm gonna disagree with the president too. But I still love my family, even though some of them I don't like, but I love them. <laughs> so we have to understand that no matter what goes on at the, in the final analysis, our children are still gonna be hungry after November 6th. People are still going to be homeless. Children are still gonna to need a, to have a better education. People are still going to need jobs and the person that is going to do that better than anyone else is the person that's there now. So go out and vote. Vote for each one of us. We're on the ballot to every single member of Congress. Carolyn is sitting there looking at us like, oh, I'm glad I don't have to deal with that anymore. Uh, but do understand that, as people say, this really is going to be the most important election of our lifetime. I am depending on you because I know that you can and you will make sure that our communities are strong because you are strong. Thank you. God bless you. I had to double check that. When You heard what Congresswoman uh, Marcia Fudge just said. Fourteen members of the CBC are black women. And we all know that 10 percent of the House of Representatives are African American. It's 42 plus one. And we say plus one because we keep Alan West in prayer. Come on, Florida. <laughs> we do. I can say that because I let, thank you, Florida. We, Am I okay, Congresswoman? I, we keep him in prayer. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, so I mean, that's, that, that's huge because that's less than the percentage of African Americans that live in the country. So we do need more representation. How many black senators do we have? None. Just saying. I want to bring up now, just saying, um, I want to bring up now Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee because we talk about how many African Americans are in the House of Representatives. We just did how many black women are there. How many African American women uh, busts are represented in the statutes and statutory hall? Anybody want to guess? Yeah, it's less than one. <laughs> it's none. <laughs> it's none. And. Um, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee has been at the forefront of trying to change that. And uh, as this forum is named Sojourner Truth Legacy Project, that is really the core um, of what she is fighting for because the idea that, that somebody of that, M of that moment of that importance is not represented in statutory hall is very important. So I want to bring up uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. She is an influential, influential and forceful voice in Washington. She's serving in her ninth term, um, that's 18 years, as a member of the United States. House of Representatives representing the 18th, she's 18th year in District 18 in Texas, uh, centered in Houston, which is the energy capital of the world. She's considered by many to be the voice of reason in the House and has been dedicated to upholding the constitutional rights of all people. Congresswoman Jackson Lee has led the struggle to have Sojourner Truth's bus located in her rightful place in the Statuary Hall of the United States Capitol, which would make her uh, the first African-American woman to be so honored, um, along with historic leaders and champions of freedom and dignity for all Americans. So let us bring up Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, and she's going to talk about the history.
Always good to give a sisterly hug. Good morning, my sisters. It is a privilege and a pleasure to be here with you this morning uh, and to offer a little perspective on history uh, and to be able to excite you for the soldiers on the battlefield that you are. Uh, I am honored to be here with all the beautiful women that I see on the front row and for this stellar group of African-American women, the Congressional Black Caucus, the Sisters of the Caucus, would you give them an enormous and wonderful applause. I do want to thank Prudential as well for its reason and rightness in sponsoring uh, this morning. I see so many icons in the audience, so forgive me for not acknowledging them all, but I do want to say I want to especially thank uh, Yvette and Dr. Scott uh, for the legacy uh, and for handling the baton. Because as you handle the baton, look at the throngs who are here scattered across America, soldiers that they are, that are ready to carry that baton so that we can save our children and save America. I thank you for that. I also want to acknowledge uh, uh, my good friend, uh, Carolyn Kilpatrick, who we shared uh, so much with and who understood the work that we were doing to put this bus where it needed to be, but also the message of this great opportunity. And then uh, to be able to acknowledge that in this day, that we will take another truth sayer, a woman who tells the truth, and that is Sabrina Fulton, will be acknowledged and will also be part of the truth saying that will go forward. It is my task to give you both a little bit of history uh, and as well just a little message as I go to my seat. But allow me to say to you that truth is international, is it not? Uh, the truth of our heritage, the truth of our origins, where we have come from. Most of us who happen to be African-American women have first started our journey on the motherland, the continent, and made waves through South and Central America, some through Canada, some through the Caribbean, as I might call myself a Jamaican. It is my uh, pleasure then to say to you that I am honored to have the governor of Emo State of Nigeria here with us today, and I wanted to acknowledge him, His Excellency uh, Governor Roches Oroka, if he would please stand, who is here today, and uh, we're going to be educating him about Sojourner Truth. He is joined by Senator Izunasco, who is here as well. Um, we are delighted to have him from the Emo State, and the Commissioner of Information, a wonderful woman, and that is the Honorable Commissioner Ofor is here with us today. Oh, a gentleman, excuse me. <laughs> He's not a woman. All right. I am just simply coming to say to you that our history is vital. The Honorable Shirley Chisholm, uh, who many of you know, uh, took the participation of African American women to another level and ran for the presidency of the United States of America. For those of us around and those of us that could look and see and touch, oh, how we stood tall. But well, we're not very mindful of the fact that when Shirley came to Congress, from Brooklyn, no less, Yvette, they put her on the Agricultural Committee. And at first, Shirley said, well, you know, this is where they call the ultimate insult. I'm from the inner city of Brooklyn. Until she finally recognized that a tree grows in Brooklyn. And boy, did they not want her on the Agricultural Committee anymore. She made the Agricultural Committee stand up to the ownership that it was a lifeline of so many with the Supplemental Nutrition Program. But more importantly, she had something to say. And that is the core genius of the organizing of the uh, Congress of Black Women that many of you know so much about. And from that time, that organization partnered with women's groups around the nation. The Congress became a stellar voice. And of course, it was led by the Honorable C. Dolores Tucker, for those of you from Pennsylvania, who know that you can never silence C. Dolores Tucker. Anybody want to have some hand waving in here? Oh, I see there's some testifiers in here. I am so grateful that she mentored me. Dr. Barbara Williams Skinner knows that mentoring because every program, Dr. Skinner was there testifying and praying, and C. Dolores Tucker could not ever have a program without her, and she could never say no. I give you this history because I got wedded to the shoulder and the arms, along with Dr. Michelle Battle. I don't know if she's in the room. 
to Dr. Tucker. She would not let us go. She would not let Diane Watson go. She got wedded when she came in. And she wouldn't let Juanita Melinda McDonald, may she rest in peace, our dear sister. She would not let her go. And she was on the House Administration Committee. And we would walk back and forth. When I first came to Congress, I joined with uh, Carolyn Maloney, who wanted the women, all of us, we were two and three and four at that time. You all start calculating and I came in the dark ages, but uh, there were women before me, Carter's Collins and all these beautiful women that were the early birds. But what happened is a suffragette statute, and this is important history, and I'm going through it fast, that is in the uh, rotunda. That is, do you know these names? Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony. You know these names, anybody? All right. They had a statute. It was in the basement. The men had not brought the statute up under pretense it was too heavy, they couldn't carry it, etc. It was in the basement as early as 1995, in the basement. And so women got together, all of us, to petition for it to come up. The statute has three faces, and then it has an unfinished stone. And black women argued that that was Sojourner Truth that because she was black, you would not put her on there. Oh, they made all kinds of arguments. But the deal we cut, Dr. Melvo knows, that if we help you bring it up, all of our women petition, then you've got to help us. Now, we worked hard. You don't know the fight we had to be able to say that the stone should be made into Sojourner Truth. But they argued and said, oh, that wasn't the intent of the sculpture. Oh, that person is dead. Oh, we can't talk to them. And this came the birth of the resolution uh, that HR 937 to be able to get our own statute of the Honorable Sederna Truth. But I will tell you, like any other bill that in the good days, uh, this is a different day now, we have a different conflict. But in the good days, you work a little bit on a bill and it would pass. Well, I can tell you that this was a mountain to climb. We literally drove a pathway with our footprints of C. Dolores Tucker and the three members back and forth between the House and Senate being rebuffed that this is not what we wanted to do. My sisters, there's something about the strength of our heart and our courage and our determination. And C. Dolores Tucker wanted this to be, if not her living legacy, a legacy for women of color around America. I was glad to be, in essence, uh, the attender to her vision. And we joined with then Senator Hillary Clinton because Sojourner passed through several states. One of them happened to be New York. Rebuffed and rebuffed and rebuffed. First they said, who's gonna do the statute? Who's gonna do the sculpturing? Where are you gonna get the money? And we just kept saying, we're washerwomen. We know how to clean and clean up. We know how to get to the batter's box and make a home run. We know how to be like Harriet Tubman and get the job done. And so as much as they rebuffed us, we finally, through many signatures of co-sponsors, many protesting and petitioning, many saying we can't, it can't be done, and many of you have seen one day we will have another annual celebration in honor of the fact that Sojourner is in her place in the Capitol, but not finally in her place. But we ultimately passed the legislation that created the Sojourner Truth Statute. It was not an easy task. We wound up funding. I raised the monies. And this is the best news. The sculpturer is an African-American beautiful woman from California. Oh, they didn't think that could ever happen. And she cast this beautiful sculpture, this statute, which is the only statute in the United States Capitol, built by slaves of an African-American woman. And so I leave you, if anything, with the wonderment of this legacy. My commitment is to join and to spread this across America. Is it not valued that way? So that there will be truth sayers that will carry this legacy and this leadership 
and there will be people in Appalachia, there will be those in the Delta, those walking the streets of 125th Street, maybe somebody in Alaska, a returning black woman soldier from the battlefields around the world will be able to say, I'm a Sojourner Truth truth sayer. And God will tell me and help me never to stand away from my moral courage, because that's what Sojourner Truth was all about. Ladies and gentlemen, but my sisters, take to your heart her words. Whenever you're at the coffee pot, whenever somebody puts you down, whenever you can't find a way to make it, whenever there's a high mountain and you cannot climb, say what Sojourner said, ain't I a woman? I've born 13 children and seen most all sold into slavery. This election is about you. And I want you to say, ain't I a woman? I'm going to stop our babies being shot like Trayvon. I'm going to stop women not having things. And I'm going to look to say, ain't I a woman? That's the legacy of Sojourner Truth. God bless all of you. God bless the United States of America. Wow, that was a powerful presentation. Am I wrong? That was a powerful presentation. I mean, it, it, you have to really get that because, you know, you think about Sojourner Truth born in the 18th century and lived into the 19th and who was herself first sold away from her mom and dad. Think about that. You were nine years old, sold away from your mother and father at nine. Nine years old, sold to strangers, sold multiple times, abused. She wouldn't even write about the specifics of some of the abuse that she suffered, but it just assumed, read into history, the things she dealt with, and I think Congresswoman Jackson Lee gave us a really important history lesson, because this is not ancient history, right? If you are in your 90s, it's possible to have a great-grandparent or grandparent who was sold, a human being, nine-year-old child, and then watched her children one by one by one by one. So it's important, and I think that the things that she was able to do, you know, when she was called to become a preacher and traveling around the country and speaking, that's incredible. Think about that in the 18th century. So that's important. So we definitely want to acknowledge that history. Um, I want to now bring up Dr. Elsie Scott. Uh, it's my pleasure to bring her to the podium. She is the woman who is the driving force behind the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and this annual legislative conference. Uh, it, it's one of its signature programs, clearly. Dr. Scott is president and CEO. For the past seven years, she's literally put the CBCF on the map uh, and the training ground, and made it a training ground for equipping and training young leaders in the areas of public policy. And under her leadership, the CBCF has become a powerhouse for high quality public policy forums, and they're taking on important issues like HIV AIDS, healthcare, educating our young black men, our, our, you know, our black boys, which is so important. And Dr. Scott is gonna give us a welcome on behalf of the CBCF, and she will acknowledge our sponsor, because you know what, without the sponsor, We'd all be at home <laughs> today. So, okay, so let me bring up Dr. Elsie Scott. Please give her a warm welcome. Good morning, everybody. Those of you who work around Washington and worked on the Hill, you know that when we do sessions, everything is moving parts. And we had thought last week that there would not be any votes this week. Uh, we thought that the Republicans were gonna dismiss Congress on Tuesday and that we wouldn't have to worry about the members having to run in and out, but that didn't happen. So our women of the CBC will be coming in and out, and we thank all of those who have been able to come in with us today. This is the fourth year of this event, and Congresswoman Carolyn Cheeks Kilpatrick has already been acknowledged, but let me just acknowledge her again for being the driving force behind the creation of this event. And when we did the first, the first Sojourn the Truth session, it was somewhat in reaction to, as Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee has already mentioned, it was sort of in reaction to the bus and the way some of the women felt that black women were not acknowledged enough for their role in getting that bus placed in the Capitol. But of course, once we had one session, then people say, you have to do this again. And so now it has grown into a big session. And then, as you know, it has grown beyond just a session. We now have the Sojourner Truth movement. <laughs> and we had, 
We plan to take it out to some of the districts. I know uh, Congresswoman Clark is moving to bring it to Brooklyn. Congresswoman Barbara Lee has talked about bringing it to Oakland, California. So stay tuned. Uh, and then also, last night, some of you got a chance to join us because we were also able to do a women's leadership reception last night and welcome the women who have come into Washington for the conference, as well as to try to showcase the women of the CBC. And let me just make one correction that there's been an error made and spoken several times this morning that there are 14 black women in the Congressional Black Caucus. There are 15. They are all, if you look back on the wall, that's the power of the black woman on Capitol Hill. Those are the pictures of all of the female, black female members of the House of Representatives. And we hope that we'll be adding others there. I thought that there are a couple of, of uh, our sisters we have hoping were gonna be able to join us today, Joyce Beatty and, and Val Dimmons, but we hope that we will run into them sometime during the uh, conference. So as we continue this intergenerational dialogue, we hope that you will continue to go back to your communities and work to empower and educate black women. Let me just mention that this will be my last sojourner in this role because after the conference, I will be moving on to Howard University to, to be the leader of the Ron Walters Center on Leadership and Public Policy. But knowing Congresswoman Clark and Dr. Skinner, <laughs> I will still be getting calls and I will still be recruited <laughs> to continue to, to work on Sojourner. So I hope to still be engaged and I just want to acknowledge Congresswoman Yvette Clark who picked up the mantle and Dr. Barbara Skinner who has been with us from day one. And I also have to recognize Kenya Handy who has been with us since day one. And we had another young lady you all met who was my staff person for this project, Victoria White. And she's not with us this year because she got accepted into Harvard Law School. And she's at Harvard now. So we are developing that next generation of African-American women. So I had to pluck another staff member, Katrina Finch. Where is Katrina? When Katrina volunteered for this project, she had no idea, you know, because she has a regular job on the CBCF staff. She had no idea that this was going to become a full-time job. But thank you, Katrina, for all of your work. And as you know, when we do these things, they don't come free. So we had to reach out to some of our friends in the corporate world. And one of our friends who's been with us since day one has been Prudential. Sharon Taylor, who serves on the board of the CBCF, thank you for always being here for us. And then this year, we reached out, and SCIU wanted to join us also. Is anybody here from SCIU? Thank you very much for being here, and thank you for your support. As well as Pfizer. Is anybody here representing Pfizer? Okay, well, we thank Pfizer for joining us. And we have a new member of the CBCF board, Pamela Alexander. And many of you know her. She represents the Ford, Ford Motor Fund. And when I said that we now wanted to do a reception before the forum, this was her first board meeting. And she said, I'll do it. And so, Pamela, are you here? Is anybody here from Ford? Anyway, when you see Pamela Alexander, just thank her for stepping in and becoming our title sponsor for last night. So let me just close and just thank you for your support to ask you to stay engaged, that this is a very critical year and we need all of the votes, we need all of your engagement. And it's already been mentioned that black women came out in larger numbers in the last election than any other race or gender group. And so we want to do it again. Okay, for the conference, and this is probably especially important to the young people in the group, 
We want you to tweet about what's happening here, so I hope somebody's tweeting already. And so if you're tweeting, please use our hashtag. The hashtag is CBCF ALC 2012. And then, as you see up here on the screen, we have a mobile app. You can download to your cell phone, and this is how you access it. The information is up there. You can go to iTunes or Google Play. So we are coming into the 21st century, and also we are, we are on, uh, and CBCF is on Facebook, and so we hope that you will continue to post and write about us, and we look forward to the great panel. I want to thank all the outstanding women who will be speaking here today, and now I guess I'll bring Joy back to the podium. All right, thank you very much, and now um, I'm going to bring back Congresswoman Yvette Clark, who is going to present uh, our Woman of Truth Award um, to someone who uh, the country really has come to know uh, and, and many African American women has come to, have come to see a, as a role model. So I'm going to bring back Congresswoman Yvette Clark. You just heard from our leader of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, Dr. Elsie Scott, and you heard from her that uh, she will be moving forward to a new mission at Howard University. And Dr. Scott has been a driving force in the growth and development of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. The number of lives that this foundation has touched, young people, interns, fellows, the type of work they have been doing nationally has been given national recognition, and I attribute that to her outstanding leadership. We are grateful to Dr. Scott for all of her sacrifice, for all of her talent, skill, and ability that she has utilized on behalf of this foundation, and quite frankly, on behalf of African Americans across this nation. And we wanted to make sure that she knew how grateful we were. Uh, this was not an official part of uh, the celebration because we, as you just found out, found out fairly recently ourselves that she would be moving forward. But we wanted to take this opportunity in the presence of so many women to say to her that we honored her womanhood. We honor women in high places doing great things, using their talents and sacrificing for all of us. So I'd like to ask Dr. Elsie Scott to join us here to receive from us a Woman of Truth Award. I'm just going to use this mic a moment. And it reads, Women of Truth Award to Dr. Elsie L. Scott for your unsurpassed excellence in producing next generation leaders, your incomparable strength of character and courage advancing African American empowerment, and your matchless leadership in moving the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation to new heights as a powerful resource and beacon of hope for African Americans in the true spirit of Sojourner Truth. On this 20th day of September 2012, presented by the CBC Women Members and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation during the 42nd Annual Legislative Conference. Amen. Thank you very much, Dr. Scott. It is now my very distinct honor and privilege to present to you another outstanding woman. In the true spirit of sisterhood and strength, it is now my distinct honor to bring to the podium a woman who has come to be admired for her courage and for her sacrifice, and her family have had to make in our collective struggle for justice and equality for Americans. Ms. Sabrina Fulton, the mother of Trayvon Martin, is also 
this year's recipient of the Woman of Truth Award. <laughs> Sabrina Fulton came to prominence under very tragic circumstances. Her dignity and integrity was on display for our entire nation to view. As mothers, as sisters, as grandmothers, our hearts went out to her. But through it all, she strengthened all of us as well. We received a blessing and a gift as she found her voice in pursuit of justice for her son. Unrelentless in her seeking out justice, rallied a nation. People of every walk, every faith, saw her face, heard her cry, and moved mountains to get justice for Trayvon. We never know what the, mar the next day will bring. We never know when we can be plucked from our communities and, uh, and out of obscurity to just take a stand. And had Ms. Fulton just been a shrinking violet, perhaps we would never have known the crisis that had occurred in this community, the laws that had been put in place in this state that enable such a tragic thing to occur. But in the 21st century, there's a woman we know named Sabrina Fulton. That's right. She stands in the gap for all those mothers whose children have been senselessly taken from them. She stands in the gap for all who seek justice in America and have a cry to be heard. We've heard you, Sabrina Fulton, and you are a woman of truth. God bless you. We'd like to bring up uh, Trayvon's brother. Javaris Fulton and uh, is this the mother? Grandmother. grandmother. We'd like to bring grandmama up here too. Because attorney ben. attorney ben. I'm sure that um, it's in the DNA, so grandma got to be up here. Everyone, uh, just scoot over just a little bit so we can get a full picture. Woman of Truth Award to Miss Sabrina Fulton for your extraordinary example of courage, your commitment to justice for African Americans, and especially African American youth, in memory of your beloved son, Trayvon Martin, and in the spirit of Sojourner Truth, a champion of freedom. On this 21st day of September 2012, presented by the Congressional Black Caucus Women Members and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation during the 42nd Annual Legislative Conference. God bless you, Ms. Fulton. God bless the family. We stand with you. You are Sojourner Truth. I'd just like to say thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to represent my son. Um, he has no voice right now. And I feel that it is my duty as a mother to stand up for my child. I also understand that it, that is not going to bring my baby back. That is not going to bring my son back. But I have committed to fight for your sons and your daughters. And lastly, I want to leave you. Just know that God is still in control. Thank you. Thank you.
And our evolution of what was initially just the Sojourner, Sojourner Truth Project has now become a movement, as you all know. You're all a part of that movement. But we have been blessed to have visionary sponsors who understood the relevance and significance of what the women of the CBC were trying to do, what the goals, the dreams, the aspirations were for the people we represented, and most importantly, the women we seek to empower across our nation. I want to thank Prudential through Ms. Sharon Taylor for grabbing onto that vision with us. And I'd like to ask you if you would just share a few words with um, our movement women this morning. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to be here again uh, to honor the Sojourner Truth Continuing the Legacy Theory series. We have been here from the beginning and we continue to be moved by the dogged determination of those who have put this movement together and continue to evolve it. You know, empowering women to succeed is important and it requires nurturing support. And I think these sessions prove as a, serve as a reminder and an inspiration to all of us about the importance of leadership and the importance of Sojourner Truth and her role as a leader. And we all have the same capacity that she has if we choose to stand and lead. And I'm fortunate in many ways to work for an organization that has leadership as one of its core values. But you know, leadership doesn't come with a title, it's not easy, and it's not just bestowed on a person by level or by title. And you know, there are many people who have the title, but who choose to sit silent and not lead. And as I think about Sojourner Truth and her rich legacy, she would stand up and look around and say, ladies, we have more to do. Being a leader and doing nothing is, worse, is a worse sin than, than leading and not caring. And I know the women that are here today are here because they choose to make a difference. And so let's continue to use forums like this to spread the word and to reinforce the fact that 25 years later, there's still more to do. There's still more to do. There's still more to do in health. There's still more to do in education. There's still more to do in business. There's still more to do in government. And we're proud to support those efforts, which is why we continue to be here every year. Because as a leader in my company, we can make choices. And I can ask the tough questions and choose to put some of our precious resources behind things that matter. So I'm delighted to be here today, not only as a leader in the company, but with several of my prudential female leaders to stand with you to pursue the dreams of pursuing the truth, because we know there's more to do. And we know we must continue to lead lead in education, lead in health, lead in business, and indeed lead in government. Because Sojourner Truth left a powerful legacy for us to do just that. And as you've heard from many others who have spoken before me, ladies, we have more to do. People talk about the 80-20 rule. I know that we can reverse that so that 80% of our women do 100% of the work. Ladies, we're delighted to stand with you and be here today. Thank you. Okay, now I wanna ask our panelists um, to come up and give you guys a two minute stretch while we have our panelists come up and get situated on the stage. So um, if you need restrooms, it's out and then you make a left and another left. Um, there's coffee and refreshments here. So we're gonna take a two minute break. Coffee. Okay, I wanna introduce the panel. This is a, an exciting opportunity for you to interact with some really dynamic women who are gonna talk to us about some of the fundamental issues that are facing African-American women. Uh, and I'm gonna quickly introduce everyone and then have each person give a brief opening statement and then we're going to jump right into it. Uh, Dr. 
Dr. Julian Malvo, who's going to talk to us about economics. Um, she's the president emerita of Bennett College for Women. Uh, Dr. Malvo, as everyone knows, uh, is an economist, author, a commentator. Um, and currently, she's the honorary co-chair of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Where's Marcia Fudge? When <laughs> she had a red folder that she was walking around with. Um, and she also serves on the board of the Economic Policy Institute and the uh, Recreation Wishlist Committee of Washington, D.C. Dr. Malvo is the founder and thought leader of Last Word Productions, Inc., which has published her newest work, Surviving and Thriving, 365 Facts in Black Economic History. Please give her a round of applause. Uh, Ms. Francis, Ms. Francis Ash Goins, who's going to talk to us about health. Uh, and we're, and we're going to bear with her because I think she's actually not feeling so, so well, but we are really glad that she came in today. And uh, Dr. Ash Goins is an affiliate, prof uh, an affiliate professor at the University of South Carolina's Arnold School of Public Health and College of Nursing. She initiated the formation of key national advisory panels for women's health and spearheaded the creation of many innovative initiatives to address women's health issues, including the Minority Women's Health Summits, National and State Summits on Young Women's Health, the National Capitol Hill Town Hall Meeting on Lupus, and the first National Women's and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day. She's received several Department of Health and Human Services Secretary's Awards for Distinguished Service, uh, has been featured in Jet Magazine, hey, Jet Magazine, Washington Post, Essence Magazine, I used to read that as a kid, uh, and Minority Nurse, Minority Nurse Magazine, among, uh, among others. Please acknowledge Ms. Frances Ash Goins. All right. Ms. Tamika Hart uh, is going to sp speak to us about education. Um, she is the fifth president and CEO of Memphis er, of the Memphis Urban League and the first woman to hold that position in the 80-year history of the organization. Um, that's, that's not bad. She is an, a native Memphian who taught school for five years in Cobb County, Georgia. She practiced labor and employment law and in 2004 was elected to the Memphis City Schools Board of Commissioners, serving also as board president. Under former Tennessee Governor Phil Bredesen, uh, Hart served on Tennessee's Race to the Top proposal team and Tennessee's 15-member Teacher Evaluation Advisory Committee and also the Steering Committee of the Tennessee State Collaborative on Reforming Education. Please uh, give a round of applause to Ms. Tamika Hart. Mrs. Kimberly Peeler Allen uh, is our expert today on politics. She's co-founder of Higher Heights for America. She's a highly skilled political fundraiser and event planner. I'm going to say that again, fundraiser, because you know what? You want to know why black people don't have as much political power as we'd like? Ask any politician. We don't give money. Uh, Ms. Peeler Allen is respected as the only African-American full-time fundraising consultant in New York State, the only one, making my point once again. She was named on the Crane's New York Business 40 Under 40 list, as well as the Feminist Press 40 Under 40. She joined with Ms. Glinda Carr to found Higher Heights for America, which is a national 501c4 organization uh, that seeks to elevate black women's voices to shape and advance progressive policies and politics by strengthening black women's civic participation in grassroots advocacy campaigns and the electoral process. Higher Heights for America will create the environment in which more black women and other candidates who are committed to advance policies that affect black women can be elected to public office. Please acknowledge Mrs. Kimberly Peeler Allen. And Ms. Barbara Arnwine Esquire, I love that, uh, who's going to talk about criminal justice. Uh, and Ms. Barbara Arnwine is an executive director for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Uh, Ms. Arnwine is an internationally renowned uh, uh, expert for contributions on criminal justice issues, including the passage of the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1991. She continues to champion civil rights issues nationally and internationally. She's also a prominent leader of election protection, very important, the nation's largest nonpartisan voter protection coalition, very key in this year. In October 2011, she was one of five recipients of the prestigious Gruber International Justice Prize for her excellence in defending and promoting civil rights and gender equality throughout the U.S. She's the recipient of numerous awards. Ms. Arnwine is a member of the American Bar Association Section on Individual Rights and Responsibilities, as well as a board member of the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty and Equal Justice Work. Please acknowledge Ms. Barbara Arnwine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. 
And now that I feel completely inferior and unaccomplished, let's oh, get on with our panel. <laughs> these are some dynamic women. OK, um, so we want to talk about all of these issues that matter so much um, to African-American women. And I want each of you guys to briefly go through and just talk about how, um, in each of your areas of expertise, black women are directly impacted, particularly in this election year. So let's start with you, Dr. Malvo. Well, thank you. Let me first of all thank Barbara Skinner and the organizers of this event. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Sojourner Truth movement actually came down to Bennett College. We had hoped that uh, we would get all the women members very ambitious. Uh, we were able to get two because, unfortunately, certain people uh, in Congress decided they were going to have a health care <laughs> vote um, the same day as we decided to have our conference. <laughs> Usually they let out on Thursday, but mm -hmm. they decided to extend that to Friday. When I say they, I don't mean all they. I mean, Mr. Boehner, just for the record. <laughs> We're trying to keep it clean here. Um, so we won't talk about the intellectually challenged or anything like that. But in any case, I just want to say that we had a great team that came. Barbara Skinner was one. And I just wanted to acknowledge, although she isn't here anymore, Dr. Vanessa Weaver, who helped us not only with the first Sojourner Truth uh, gathering, but also by bringing the group to Bennett. And I, Barbara, I'm sorry that we don't have Joe Coleman here with this song. He has a song. I won't try to sing it. Uh, Barbara and I, Barbara Skinner and I have pledged to never sing in front of people uh, <laughs> because we cannot carry a tune. It's against the law in 30 states for me to sing. Um, but in any case, he has a song called I Am Sojourner Truth that's really inspirational. And next year, you'll have to, if you can, get Brother Coleman, at least get the tape because it really is a song that just kind of lifts us all up. So it's really a, a delight to be here for the fourth year of this uh, Sojourner Truth movement. And I think in the pledge, it talked about reaching out to all sisters regardless of circumstances. So I want to start there for a reason. Um, when we have these gatherings and we come together, most of us, let's be honest, are middle class, if not upper middle class. Our sisters who are in the hood and the projects cannot afford to be here unless they're in Washington. Uh, we have to lift up voices for these sisters. Too many of us have distanced ourselves from the women who had households, for the women like Trayvon's mother who had, I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of Trayvon Martins. There's a boy who they said, yes, he supposedly hung himself oh, in the please. jail. That's ridiculous. There's another, he had handcuffs on. Right. And somehow he shot himself with the handcuffs on. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear these stories every day. I'm not going to dwell on that, but I mentioned the sisters who are not here because the first piece of data I want to give you is the number of households in poverty that are headed by single women. We got two reports in the last three weeks that give us great information about the status of women. One was the poverty, it's called the Poverty Health and Income Report that came out of the Department of Census www.census.gov. You want to look that information up. And it said that 40.3% of the women who had households, 40.3% uh, of women had households in our community are poor. 40.3%. That's two <coughs> out of five. That number has been going up. Now, these are especially the women who are affected by the public policy that some people would like to have. Sequestration which is where the budgets will be cut, immediately affects poor African-American women. We who have voice and opportunity have to talk about what sequestration will do for our people. The other piece of data that's interesting is the unemployment data, which of course comes out on the first Friday of every month. This month, while white unemployment stayed about level, went down a little bit, black women's unemployment went up. Our unemployment rate is over 12%. The unemployment rate for African-American men is a, just a touch higher at about 13.5%. The rate for black men has been going down, while the rate for black women has been going up. In the past three months, we've lost over 100,000 jobs in our community. Now, somebody is going to say that's not a lot of jobs. In fact, I did a debate where those interesting people on the th other side of the aisle who say, but that's not any jobs. It's statistically insignificant. Ah. So well, let me take your job, and then you'll see <laughs> what's statistically <laughs> insignificant. You know, because you're writing off 100,000 people, again, many of whom are moms, et cetera. To Brother Romney's data that 47% of people are uh -oh. just laying around chilling um, <laughs> as victims, here's what we know about the income that he has. <laughs> Fewer than 3% of all African Americans have incomes over $150,000 a year. My Lord. If it's, if it's over 200,000, his so-called middle class, it's 1.3%. So if you think about that, 
his middle class has us, 1.3% of us there, I guess that means that 98.7% of us are poor in the Romney world. So let's just be clear that these data are not real data. The average American, the average American household has an income of $51,000 and it's down by about $700 yeah. from last year. But the average African American household, average, half on top, half on the bottom, $32,000 and down by $1,000 from last year. So when we talk about the average person in our community, we really have to talk about income and wealth. There was a piece of data that came out this time last year. The average Ameri African American woman who heads a household has $5 of median wealth, $5. Put in the hood, five dollars. Yep. That's enough for Coca-Cola. It's enough for some at Starbucks. Don't put too much cream in it, or it's going to be more than five dollars. Um, and so we, we're looking at, and wealth is about not what you cop, it's what you keep. Right. Um, right. And so we look at wealth in our community. Wealth is also access. So from my former position as president emerita Bennett, tuition, room, and board was twenty-five thousand dollars. Now. That's a relative bargain in higher education space. Harvard is 60 grand. So wow. $25,000 for tuition, room, and board is reasonable. But if you have a median income of $32,000, how do you pay that tuition, room, and board? We want to lift up President Obama, of course, for raising the Pell Grant to $5,500. But again, if tuition, room, and board is $25,000, where does the other $19,000 $500 come from. I dwell on this, and I know my sister who is an educator will pick up on this, but I dwell on this because wealth is access. Whether we're talking about you know, purchasing a home, helping your children, but also college education. There are two bridges to better income for African American women. One is education. Only 18% of the African American community over age 25 has a college degree. The unemployment rate for those with college degrees today is 4%. Overall unemployment, 8% overall black unemployment, 14%. Don't have me rolling these statistics off because y'all know what I mean. But if you don't have access to dollars, you don't have access to education. So that's one. The other way that we begin to narrow the gap is by taking care of some of our own habits, by saving and investing in our own organizations and opportunities. Everybody does not have to own a business. And mm. frankly, some people should not. <laughs> right. But everybody can invest in black business with the right kind of agreement that gives you a rate of return just like you get one in the bank. And so we begin to close the gap when we do some working on ourselves. The other way we close the gap is by dealing with public policy that deals with income and wealth. And we can't take the policy piece off the table. And finally, because she's looking at me funny. <laughs> she, she did say three minutes, but you cannot basically boil down the entire economic status to three minutes. You really can't. Uh, but, but finally, what I want to put on the table, which is an unpopular word, but as I've spent a lot of time looking at the situation, I just want to raise up the issue of reparations. Uh, basically, you will not close wealth gaps, wealth gaps, until you deal with the issue of how you begin to redistribute wealth. So a lot of people get real, I know like the, the real bougie people, you say reparations, they, say, <laughs> they, close. they get real. You know, <laughs> Somebody I'm going to leave the room in a minute. Yes, I used to be a baby panther. Don't mind that. But, uh, but the reparations issue, if you want to clean it up, you can call it endogenous infusions, a surplus capital. But the fact is that we don't close the gap. We can have more, but we don't close the gap until we see other money coming into our community. Because quite frankly, we used to be somebody else's wealth. We have a lot to catch up with. Now, another way that we could begin to close gaps is if we are awarded the possibility of working in monopolies. Because when you work in a monopoly, you essentially clean up. Uh, you, Bill Gates, when he entered essentially the tech world, entered a quasi-monopoly. I mean, some of y'all have Androids, but there are 10 million iPhones that are going to go on sale tomorrow. Yes. You know, praise the Lord, my Apple stock is going right, to go right up. Uh, so the awarding of monopolies. When I worked at the Council of Economic Advisors when I was a baby girl back in, I think it was 76 or 77, I saw it, I don't even remember. But I do remember a piece of legislation that was for Social Security. And hidden in that piece of legislation gave one company in Texas the opportunity to import rutile. Now I'm urban, so I didn't even know what rutile was. It's a hemp. But one company, one, got the exclusive right to import rutile. So guess what happened? 
They got rich. Nobody else could compete with them. Nobody else could import Rutile. I didn't even know people needed Rutile because I didn't know what it was. But the fact is that just like that was buried inside a piece of legislation, can there not be something buried inside a piece of legislation for our community, for some of the African American people who are producing? So we have to look at all those areas. And sisters, again, I'll, I'll stop, but I want to say that we have been woefully inactive in areas of economic policy. We all want to talk about civil rights, which I think is important. We want to talk about discrimination, which is important. But the issue of equal earnings is equally, if not more important. The issue of access to wealth is important. The issue of access to education is important. So we need to lift our voices. And while we're lifting them, think about that sister, 40.3% of whom the single mom in poverty, and think about whether your voice is being lifted for her. Thank you. OK. All right. Thank you. And before we go to the next um, person, I want to just acknowledge you guys are going to, uh, if you want to ask a question, if you have an idea for a question, I believe, Dr. Skinner, are we have, do you have cards? Do we have people passing around question cards? No, we're just. We're going to just free will. OK. All right. All right. Well, I, you know, picking up on, on what you were talking about, uh, Dr. Malvo, um, one of the reasons and one of the statistical sort of data points that pinpoints uh, why black wealth is so low is the education issue. The SHOT report yeah. that just came out yesterday, uh, and if you guys aren't familiar with the SHOT report, they look at four-year graduation rates for black males every year. Mm -hmm. And the latest one shows that the black male graduation rate is 51%. Whereas the white male graduation rate is 78%. Right. When you're not graduating from high school, you are That's locked right. out of that 4% right. yeah. unemployment possibility for college. So I want to go to Tamika Hart okay. uh, to talk about that because education, you know, a lot of people, including black conservatives, including conservatives, say that this is the civil rights issue of our generation because it is the thing that holds African Americans back the most from wealth. So can you talk a little bit? about how the educational sort of uh, data impact black women. Absolutely, and I, I always um, smile when people say education is a civil rights issue of our day as if it wasn't the civil you smile rights when I issue that, yeah. of the civil rights time. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, you asked mm -hmm. Ella Baker, I mean, right. that's what that whole freedom movement was about, about education Thank too, you. about children. And so I think it has always been a civil rights issue, but I, it, is, it is very uh, enlightening to hear more people say it. Then the question becomes, and how do you make it a movement? How do you really do something about it? And, and, and so we know all the statistics. We know the higher education you get, the more your personal economics uh, will be. And also, the more your community economics, the higher your community economics, which brings a whole lot of opportunities for your communities. I mean, I'm, you know, um, as Dr. Malvo said, most of us here are middle class, but I, you know, I'm sure most of you share my story. I mean, I grew up in a working poor family. I'm a first generation college student, and so I have seen what it's like to, for my daddy not to buy me those Nikes because he just wouldn't, and now being able to buy Nikes for myself because I got an education. And so, um, so we do need to make sure that we're pushing it. We know that, and I'll use Memphis, Tennessee, my home, we know that the uh, CEOs of cities show how getting a higher education, getting college attainment, the more you get, the higher um, economic status for your community and so in Memphis Tennessee if we can just increase our college attainment by 1% just mm. 1% it will equate to a 1 billion dollar economic uh, advantage for our community mm. that is um, th that's astronomical we think 1% mm. it seems like such a low number and that is talking about across all levels because of course to move in higher education that means you do have to increase your graduation rate from your high schools. I mean, it's not just people just sitting back, you know, waiting to go to college. They also have to be prepared to go to college. And so it really goes back even to early childhood education is, is the beginning of that. And so it is, a, it is an economic issue, education is, it always has been. And from the role of women, uh, again, using my city and probably some of your cities, uh, uh, black women, um, uh, I, I am honored to live in a city where black women are the majority uh, in, in my city. Uh, but I want my city to start acting like that uh, and, mm -hmm. and understand that we have the power and that we have that power and we should be acting on that power. And so we also have a high number of black women that are single mothers. And so because of that, some of their education attainment is not as high as it could be because of some of the obstacles. So as women, what we should be doing in our communities is reaching out to those women and helping them overcome those obstacles. And those are the child care. You know, it's if they don't have themselves higher education, not necessarily understand the real connection between their child getting that great education, accessing important quality out of school learning, accessing the uh, quality 
child, early childhood education, not just daycare, not just the babysitter, but early childhood education is curriculum based and standard based and instructional uh, based for our for our community. And so black women have always let out. Uh, I don't know about you, my first early teachers were black uh, women. But when you look at Ella Baker, you know, you look at even uh, now in our school systems, you got, you know, our sister Kai Henderson in this town running the school system, Carol Johnson in Boston uh, leading out uh, the school system there. She uh, left recently, but Beverly Hall running the Atlanta public school system. So black women have always led out in education. Um, and I think that for what we need to do, if you are in a nonprofit and you don't have education as a focus, I think you need to relook at that and understand the connection between education and economics, the education and labor, and realize that you can't separate the two and start making sure we're preparing our communities as the leaders of our communities uh, to really help them understand the connection between economics and education. Uh, and so it's not just about uh, uh, individuals, it is a co collective voice. And, um, and and that will get us there. Um. All right. No, I think, and it's interesting that you, that as you say that, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just thinking in my head and going through all the linked pathologies. You know, from what Dr. Valvo was saying on the economic front, that as you're saying is fed by the lack of educational absolutely. attainment. But you are connected with the Urban League, right, uh, absolutely. Mika, and I know just from some connection to the Urban, Urban League as well that one of the issues that's often brought up in educational attainment is that you have kids that are coming to school hungry. You have kids yes. that are coming to school with absolutely. pathologies at home. We have higher levels of HIV/AIDS. Uh, in our household, so there are all these other linked pathologies. Yes. So I want to I want to go to uh, Francis Ash Goins uh, to to talk about the health link, because some of the issues in our community, when it comes to higher rates of diabetes, higher rates mm -hmm. of obesity, higher rates of HIV AIDS, really astronomical. I just lived in Florida where. Uh, Liberty City, a little community in Miami-Dade, is now the HIV-AIDS mm -hmm. capital of the United States. Mm -hmm. And that feeds everything else we're talking I'm about. I'm with Baltimore. Baltimore, <laughs> well, yeah, there's a lot of competition, yeah, right, for that title. Um, so, um, <laughs> Francis, go and talk to us a little bit about the health link to, uh, to the women. So what are the women's issues in health that are the most important? Um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Skinner and thank Dr. Scott for being here. Um, Every time I hear data and every time I hear stats, and I hear it a lot in my job that pays me from day to day that I couldn't say that I was a part of today because this session is about politics, so I guess y'all figured I'm a federal employee, okay. But anyway, so every time I hear about that, I want to think back. I want to think back to the time that my Aunt Rebecca, um, this little woman, she was about five feet. I just know I was taller than her when I was in high school. And, and how she lived in Sandy Island, South Carolina. And she's the descendants of um, rice planters who I think came from Sierra Leone. And how strong she was to walk up the hill to carry a bag of groceries on her head. You know, even at 90, I think about how strong she was. I think about my grandmother, Josephine Smith, who um, was strong through two husbands. She buried two husbands. And she still, you know, she lasted a pretty long time. I'm not sure what grandmama died of, you know, but she died. Husband. <laughs> husband. In case you all missed that, Let's Dr. Malvo said she died of husband. Let's talk about I just stress. Want to and then I think about my mom, who's now um, 84 years old, and she's got a, a little arthritis, a little overweight, little congestive heart failure, even though she never says that she does, but I can tell it because her feet are swollen every time I see her down in South Carolina. And I think about that. And then I think about through all of that stuff, when you hear the data about black women, black people, our death rates, and I think, and still we survive. And still we survive. So I come from that perspective. But, you know, since I have to talk about it, I was just reminded that the, um, on Robin Roberts was on Channel 7 to this morning, and it was talking about how she was getting stem cell and how there's yes. a call for people to yes. be a part of the donor pool. How many of you are donors? Mm -hmm. Good, let's help each other out. I got a daughter that needs a kidney. And still we rise. You know, African Americans have more disease, disability. We have cancer. We got diabetes. We got tuberculosis. We got STDs, including HIV, heart disease, cancer, stroke, kidney disease. You know, we are twice as likely to die from diabetes as white people. We, are, we have more serious conditions. Um, 
when it comes to the cancer, because we go late, and why do we go late? It may have something to do with the education, but it might have something to do with the economics also. And then when we go late, the person that we see may not be as engaging and encouraging at the time that we go there. However, in spite of all of that, we can still rise above that. We are less likely to receive health care when we do receive it. Um, sometimes we're not able to follow the instructions that the doctors are giving us because they require payment of medication that's too expensive. Exactly. You can't get the generic. You got to get the name brand thing. And sometimes it's just because we say, mm, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Or it's because I can't do it because of the economics or because of the education. Even if I go over the list of um, health diseases, heart disease is the number one killer for women. Now, mm. heart disease is a disease that takes a long time to develop unless you're born with it. And everybody knows what contributes to heart disease. Excuse me, I'm taking um, some medicines and I'm dry and got cotton mouth. Oh. <laughs> Heart disease can be caused by a whole lot of fatty tissue in our plumbing system, which is our circulation system. And how did, how did it get in there? Uh, we put it in there by a diet. I'm from South Carolina, I understand. I love my um, fat back and greens and everything else, and so do a lot of you. <laughs> Cancers, let's go to something else, because that's real touchy-feely. But I will say one thing. Um, the one thing that we can do is help our health ourselves. Many people talk about the health care system is broken. True. And we're, everybody in here is not going to be able to fix it. There are people that might fix it. There are people that might help it work. But in the meantime, the best thing you can do is not get in the health care system. I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for 40 years. First thing you come into the hospital, what are they going to do? Ask you for a form of payment. Okay, you got some form of payment, you get in. What's the next thing they're going to do? Check, Check your vital your signs. What's the next thing they're going to go? Stick a hole in you with a silver little thing, and then they're going to have this bag hanging up there, and it's got some chemicals in it. It's going to come down and go into your body. It's not normal. The fluids that's coming into your body, but it's going to help you, especially if you're coming in dehydrated. You stay there long enough, you know you're going to get a shot, you're going to get some pills, you're going to get some other chemicals. And if you stay in there more than three days, your chance of getting a hospital acquired infection, I used to work in infection control, is greatly increased. And Lord knows if you have to go to surgery and somebody does the wrong surgery on the wrong part. I've been there too, I've seen that happen. I've been there, okay. So we need to stay out of it. So how do we stay out of it? You already know the answer to that. What about cancers? Okay, the first time you feel that little lump in there, don't ignore it, go check somebody, get somebody to check mm. it out. Okay, so I had one. I got it checked out. I got it checked out three times because I got, you know, good insurance. <laughs> it wasn't cancer, thank God, but I got it checked out. What about the stroke? Smoking, 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 smoking. Smoking around children causes more children to have asthma-related conditions. Smoking yourself can lead to stroke. What about diabetes? So you just got a touch of diabetes, right? <laughs> my sister, my sister in sugar. South Carolina. Okay, I, was, I wasn't gonna go to sugar, sugar. but I go to sugar. <laughs> sugar diabetes, okay, I'm from the South, that's my family. My sister, what, it working in the hospital, did not think that she had that. Had one of her staff people looking at her saying, you don't look right, you need to go to the emergency room. Diabetic, her sugar was so high, they had to put her in intensive care immediately. But she got the message, she's lost about 30 pounds, and she's much better. She doesn't have to take the shots anymore, now she's on the pill. Diabetes, we can do something about that. Kidney disease, runs in families. Did y'all know that? Mm. Runs in families. My daughter, I told you, chronic kidney disease at age 17. She had chronic kidney disease. Wow. I didn't, I'm a nurse. I didn't know where that came from. But later I found out, okay, my husband's side of the family. There are about seven people on his side of the family that now has kidney disease, wow. and they're all on dialysis. What about septicemia? What about flu? What about pneumonia? How many of you religiously get your shots? 
All right, for all of you that don't get your shot, it is free in some places, okay? You can get it, you should get it. Okay, so it's early for me for the flu shot. So I was sitting on the plane coming back from Hawaii. Okay, I was working, I really was, from <laughs> nine to six, every morning, every day. But it was a long flight back. I was, I, back. I was sitting by these two little children and they was coughing and carrying on. I got something, I don't know what I got for them little children. But it knocked me out of bed for two days. Okay, was my immune status built up? No, it wasn't, because I wasn't eating right when I was traveling. So this is the stuff you know about health. This is the stuff you can do. HIV, Lord knows, there are certain people that get HIV because they're in violent situations and they have no control over their sexual health. But for the rest of y'all, <laughs> including older women whose rates are definitely increasing with HIV, you gotta protect yourself. Don't think because he look good. <laughs> Then you don't have it. I used to work in the STD clinic in Berlin, Germany, and I used to give VD shots all the time, and soldiers would come back to me. How she look? She look, honey, I can't tell like that. It's not a way I can tell. You can't tell. HIV is ever increasing. For those of you that are in control of your sexual health, you're not getting beat down by somebody, okay? Mm. Protect yourself. Old people, young people, grandmamas, Let's work with our grandbabies, okay? Let's start training them early. My little Isis is only three and a half. Okay, her father, I trained him when he was about five. I had to put a condom on his little thing. So it's important. <laughs> oh. I wasn't expecting that. Okay, the doctor's going. I'm gonna, I'm <laughs> okay, we got to train them. We got to save some of this for the Q&A. Okay, I'm going to put a speed bump on you. <laughs> I'm gonna put a speed bump. That's why I'm not. The huh? A condom on a five-year-old. Y'all have heard everything. Yeah, he learned. I, I think people might want to ask. He learned some early. About that. Okay. He learned early. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I thought you were feel, more feeling well. You seem like you're feeling okay. I'm gonna pass out right after this. <laughs> Well I, well, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna clip you there because I think Love. there's so many issues there that people are gonna Love wanna her. ask you about, particularly the five-year-old. So I know her. they're gonna wanna get to that. Love but I wanna her. also, I wanna bring Barbara Arnwine into this because ah. all of these issues and all of these pathologies, whether it is, you know, in the economic sphere, whether it is in education, whether it is in health, we also know that we do have a criminal justice issue in our community. It is more with African-American men, but increasingly it is black women as well. I think in terms Absolutely. of teen incarceration, it's a lot more affecting um, black girls. So I wanna bring Barbara Onmar in. Talk to us about you know, how black women figure into that equation that we usually think of as, as our men. Thank you so much. Good, good morning, late afternoon, almost afternoon uh, <laughs> to everyone. Um, just wanted to start with acknowledging and starting out with the fact that there are you know, over 20 million African-American women in this country. And the first slide we're going to show is a reminder to everyone that when you're talking about the criminal justice system, the first thing you got to talk about is the judiciary. And the judges who are making decisions about who go to jail and who doesn't. The first step there is very important. In April of 2012, ABC Washington Post did a poll and found out that 84% of African Americans thinks that blacks and other minorities receive unequal treatment in the criminal justice system. A whole lot of us could have saved them some money uh, and told them uh, you know, what the stats were there. People forget that the judiciary affects everything that we do, pay equity, pay discrimination, pregnancy, health care. Remember the, the whole uh, ACCA case that just came out of the Supreme Court on quote Obamacare? sexual harassment, child custody, divorce proceedings, family planning, that's the judiciary. What people, next slide. What people don't know is that there has been a serious, at the federal level, a serious effort to obstruct the president's ability to appoint people to the courts. Not just the Supreme Court, but all the federal courts combined. And that, Second step here, you gotta look at it. The Senate has yet to confirm a single nominee submitted by the president in 2012. Moving to the next slide. 
This is what our current vacancy situation looks like in the district, the federal district courts. 78 of those uh, in the district courts, we have 78 vacancies in the circuit court 17. Uh, it also judicial emergencies. We have 27 judicial emergencies. That means there's just not enough judges to do the work that needs to be done. So you're wondering why people are sitting there and their cases haven't been heard, etc. Circuit court, there are six of those vacancies. Moving next slide. This is really important. Who do you see on the bench? You know, and we need to see this kind of diversity in the bench. There are too few women who have been appointed and who serve in state and federal judicial roles. And the stats right there just shows you what the difference is between uh, President Obama's uh, appointments and those of George Bush the second. And you'll just see a huge disparity and President Obama has done very well by women and very well by African Americans, except for, where's our woman on the Supreme Court? <laughs> there is no black woman nominated to the Supreme Court and the Black Women's Roundtable, this is our top priority. So I just wanted to remind you that this is the work we still got to do and be very clear, folks. When you think about this upcoming election, people think about a whole lot of things. But the one thing they forget the is that there will be three, an estimated, already conceded, three to four vacancies on the court in the next four years. Mm on the Supreme Court. So whoever's sitting there as president is going to make a big difference. And I see coming in the room is my, uh, uh, my leader, the Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson, Sr. Thank you, Reverend Jackson, uh, for joining us. Just had to take a moment to acknowledge you, my brother. Um, moving on to the next slide. Racial and criminal justice. People, let's start with the most important statistic on criminal justice. We know that because of the incredible work of the brilliant Michelle Alexander, that we are in the era of what she calls the new Jim Crow. And first stat that we gotta start out with is 80% of everybody who's in prison lacks a high school diploma. Direct correlation between your educational attainment and your likelihood of being incarcerated. The other thing that we know is that racial profiling is alive, that there is a huge difference between the way black children are perceived, or black youth when they create crimes, and youth create most of the crimes and of all age groups, all races, and that there is a difference of treatment. On one side they say, oh, he's wilding, he's a predator, he's dangerous, you know, lock him up. On the other side they say, oh, poor little Johnny just got it wrong today. You see, we gotta really remember that racial bias is a major part of the criminal justice system. Here's a stat to just think about. In less than 30 years, the U.S. penal population has exploded from only 300,000 incarcerated people to more than 2 million. With drug offenses and nonviolent offenses accounting for the majority of people sitting in prison. Minor offenses. And of the day that President Obama took office on January 19, 2008, I mean 2009, when he took office, People do not know that 1.3 million African Americans watched from prison. That is the incarceration rate. And we have the highest rate of incarceration in the United States. So what do we do about it? Next slide. Here are some of the things that we need to do. We need to pass the End Racial Profiling Act, which is pending and we should be all behind it. And your state, if you don't have a state racial, anti-racial profiling act, you need to look at this model legislation at the federal level and introduce it at your state level. 
It prohibits racial profiling, it requires training, it does a whole lot of other you know, really important things. The other thing that we need to do is to make the crack cocaine sentencing guidelines retroactive. And remember that under the Fair Sentencing Act, we reduced the disparity of treatment, of in, uh, criminal treatment uh, between uh, people who are incarcerated because people who are charged with crimes because of crack and powder cocaine, we increased that disparity from 100 to 1 to now to 18 to 1. Well, we need to de re decrease it to 1 to 1 because there's really no difference uh, practically between the two uh, substances. And it's just racially because who uses powder co cocaine? Guess, mainly whites. Who uses crack cocaine? Mainly blacks. That's, and crack cocaine is more treated more harshly. The other thing we need to do that's not on the slide is the majority of women who are in jail are in jail because of drug addiction. When you look at why do they, why, what is the number one common denominator of women in jail is some kind of drug addiction that helped to lead them to whatever crime that they engaged in. In our community we know we didn't talk about mental health. But in our community, we know that too many of us who are depressed, a lot of depression in our community, and people self-medicate through drugs. And that is a huge problem, and we shouldn't you know, uh, avoid talking about it. Because we have to deal with depression, we gotta deal with drug rehabilitation, we gotta be focused on that. The other thing in the criminal justice area, ex-felon reenfranchisement. Over five million African Americans banned from voting, I mean over five million people who are ex-felons banned from voting because of four states that have permanent bans, Virginia, Florida, and a couple of others. What we need to do is to really work on a federal law that makes sure that at least at the federal level people can vote in the federal elections. There's nothing to stop Congress from passing such a law. Nothing. It's just that they have not done it. Um, the states, of course, can have their own state laws, but as long as they're reasonable, and unfortunately the courts keep saying that they can ban felon disenfranchisement. Uh, the second thing is, I was listening to some of the congresswomen talking yesterday to each other, and I was really pleased to hear them talking about the work they had done to get more money into the Second Chance Act. And rehabilitation is necessary because we know recidivism is the ugliest thing about the criminal justice system. The last thing is, what can we do outside of passing legislation? You're looking at me and you're going, well, you know, what am I gonna do in my state? I got a horrible legislature, we got the you know, House in the you know, US uh, uh, Congress, it's a real problem. But one movement that's been growing, and you should be studying it and thinking about it, is that the one thing we got to do, and Reverend Jesse Jackson talks about this all the time, and I'm always happy to join him in talking about this on his, his radio show, is we gotta destroy the prison industrial complex. We gotta destroy it. Not just tolerate it. I mean, this whole, you know, these communities out there crying for prisons so that they can, quote, have employment opportunities by locking up our people, these prisons running around right now and signing contracts with states, saying that if you will give us X number of prisoners, if you will guarantee that number, then we will build X number of prisons in your state and give you X dollars. Not acceptable. What we need to do is build what's called the decarcerate movement. And there are decarcerate chapters in Pennsylvania and in other states where they actively fight inside of the state legislature to make sure that the prison industrial complex does not predominate in policy. So we need to be trying to close prisons, because there are a whole lot of prisons sitting empty right now because there's not, quote, enough people coming into the prisons. And what are they doing? They're trying to fill them up by sending more people to jail for minor uh, reasons. So we need to break that complex, we need to decarcerate. Those are just some of the things. I'm not gonna you know, go through my other slides. I have slides on employment, slides on educational opportunity, but I wanna just end on one slide if I may. 
And that slide is, let's talk about the vote. Everybody should have, when you came in, gotten one of these pamphlets. I hope that you did. Because uh, this pamphlet is out there on the table and it's accompanied by another pamphlet called the African Americans and Voter ID. And you need to have these two things, but before you leave this room, I wouldn't be anybody and I couldn't even be happy if I didn't do my Fannie Lou Hamer. So I want you to pull out your smartphones because we are under attack. That map of shame shows you all this war on voting that's going on. 5.5 million African Americans do not have the voter ID that they're talking about. 25% of all of us who vote lack the voter ID that they're talking about. This is all designed to strip us of our rights. So how do we do it? When we're in a war, what do we do, people? We fight. It's the only way we win. We don't win by just saying, well, you know, next time. No, we fight. And one of the first things we gotta do, and you will see it on the brochures, that we gotta make sure that people are VIPs, that they verify their voter registration, that they know what kind of identification is required to vote, and that they're at the correct polling place precinct, because in many states, if you're not, you're not gonna have your vote counted. They'll give you a provisional ballot, a little red, white, and blue sticker, and you'll run around to about, I voted, and it won't be counted. So it is critical that we do this. So how do we fight? We get our right weapons. We put on our whole armor, right? And this is the free mobile app that I want you to get. So go to your iPhone, go to your texting, your messaging, and put in 90975 as the address you're sending your text to. 90975. Then in your subject put one word, as one word, O-U-R-V-O-T-E, R vote. O-U-R-V-O-T-E. Send that bad boy, and it's gonna send you back the mobile app for free. And this mobile app allows you to do two critical, th I mean, a number of critical things. It allows you to verify that you're registered, because when you put your information in, the first thing it's gonna tell you is if you're registered or not. If your registration is active or inactive. If it's inactive, that's bad news, folks. You need to get registered. It's going to allow you, if you're not registered, to register. If you don't know where your polling place is, it's gonna tell you where your polling place is. It's gonna tell you what kind of ID is required in your state. But the good news is that once you finish your own information, it cleans, it goes to a clean slate again, and you can call any family member, any friend, any colleague, anywhere in the United States. And, ver and help them verify their voter registration. Remember, if you're not registered, you can't vote. The first voter registration deadlines are October 6th in a number of states, and the last one in many other states is October 16th, or, or very few states have same day, very few registration. So it's very, very critical that we deal with the fact that six million African Americans are not registered to vote. 3.8 million African Americans who voted for the first time in 2008, who registered for the first time, think that they're, quote, good. The reality is 60% of them need to be re-registered. Okay. They don't know it. So please, get that mobile app, use it, and also call our hotline, 1-866-OUR-VOTE, 1-866-687-8683. The hotline will answer any question you have about voting. And we need you, volunteer, be part of election protection, make the difference. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you very much.